Welcome to our reunion, our virtual reunion 2020, Mobilizing Design in Times of Crisis. My name is Bob Balder and I serve as the Executive Director of AAP NYC. I have the great honor of hosting today's conversation with three distinguished members of our Cornell community. But before we get started, I wanna give you some ground rules and I'm gonna turn it over to Andre so he can give you a little bit of the parameters for today's event, thank you. Thank you, Bob. I'd like to bring your attention to the top right of the screen where you will see text that reads gallery view or speaker view. When the presenters are sharing their screen like now, your choices will be limited. But when the panel is speaking, you can choose gallery view to see all panelists at once or speaker view to only view the panelists who are speaking. During the Q&A session, moving your mouse to the lower part of the Zoom window will reveal a Q&A button. Please press that button to bring up the window where you can type your question. Other guests' questions will not be visible until they have been answered. Thank you. Back to you, Bob. Thanks, Andre. Our topic today, Mobilizing Design in Times of Crisis, um, was an event that we actually anticipated focusing primarily on the work of a number of our alumni and faculty in regards to uh, the coronavirus and specifically in the development of PPE, personal protective equipment. But given the events of the past 12 days, we would like to also uh, clarify some of the critical issues that have come to fore that we would like to be able to address at the outset of our, our session today and will also be the subject of further conversations within the Cornell community. Next slide. As some of you know, uh, the president of the university, Martha Pollack, has been extremely concerned and has written to all of us about her deep discomfort with events of these past 12 days. She has stated on a number of occasions her concern and her leadership going forward including this quote, decent people and institutions cannot stand silent while such violence against our fellow citizens continues. Further, the leadership of our Dean, next slide, Mi Jin Yun, has also stated on a number of occasions and most recently put forward this statement of the legacy of racial violence and discrimination in all its forms must be called out and come to an end here and now. Next slide. Ahmad Arbery, Brianna Taylor, George Floyd, Tony McDade. It's important to take this moment to say their names. The most recent victims of racial violence against black people in this country. As many of us are aware, these are but a few names in a list that runs far too long. Black lives and black voices matter. And we want to reiterate this commitment, this college's commitment to finally ending racial violence and discrimination and creating a just and equitable world. At Cornell, President Pollack recently shared university level actions being planned, such as community conversations about race and racism, expanding that dialogue to also include local community leaders and a campus book read of how to be an anti-racist by Dr. Ibram X. Kindi. Echoing President Pollack and Dean Jun's statement, we have the power to influence and shape our world. We have a shared responsibility for our future and we must stand strong in our commitment to action and transformation. The college is planning a virtual roundtable to discuss race and repair. We hope that you'll join us for this and we welcome your participation in this conversation. It's critically important for both the college and the country. Shifting back to today's program, we will talk and explore the, of how we can best wield design and address pandemics and other urgent concerns of our time. We'll learn about the power of collective action from architects and designers that came together for Operation PPE, the Cornell-led grassroots effort to produce 3D printed personal protective equipment for healthcare workers at the Weill Cornell Medicine Center in New York City. We'll also discuss design that will be critical as we think about the reordering of our, of our lives, especially through the influence of social distancing and other acts. 
I would like to introduce now our three panelists for this afternoon. Jenny Sabin, the Arthur L. and Isabel B. Weisselberg Professor in Architecture and Associate Dean for Design Initiatives. Jenny is an architectural designer whose work is at the forefront of a new direction for 21st century architectural practice, one that investigates the intersections of architecture and science and applies insights and theories from biology and mathematics to the design of material structures. Vivian Kwan, Executive Director at Terraform One. Vivian is an architect with an interdisciplinary background in art, architecture, entrepreneurial marketing, and startups. She is dedicated to improving the future of our environment through impactful design and education. Eric Howler, Principal of Howler and Yoon Architecture. Eric is a co-founding principal of a research-driven multidisciplinary design studio working between architecture, art, and media. His firm is known for projects that are technologically and formally innovative and deeply informed by human experience and a sensitivity to tectonics. Welcome to you all. We'll go ahead and start off with Jenny and then we'll move on to Vivian and then on to Eric. Following that, we'll have a chance to have a moderated discussion where I'll be able to ask questions. And then I'll also be taking questions in the Q&A box along the way so that we can incorporate your questions. And then of course, we'll be able to conclude the session and then sessions beyond. Jenny, let me turn it over to you. Thank you, Bob. Thank you so much. Let me just share my screen here. Well, welcome everyone. It's my sincere pleasure to take part in this alumni event uh, and, and engage in a panel discussion with um, some wonderful colleagues uh, and uh, to also engage your, your questions uh, in a discussion that's very um, pressing. I thought I would spend a little bit of time uh, telling you about how Operation PPE uh, was started. I know that many of you on this call have been involved uh, in various ways. Uh, some of you perhaps um, firing up your own 3D printers in your offices. And I just want to start by saying, you know, thank you for everything that you've done uh, to make this an incredibly powerful initiative uh, that has really delivered uh, in, a, in a pressing time of crisis. So on March 24th, uh, less than a week after our campus closed due to the epidemic. Um, a, an urgent call was put out by colleagues at Weill Cornell Medicine asking if it, we could uh, perhaps fire up our 3D printers uh, and provide uh, protective face shields for our healthcare professionals on the front lines. And so myself and a few colleagues in engineering, including Kirsten P Peterson, immediately responded and with the support of Mi Jin Yoon and our facility director at AAP, uh, within less than 24 hours, and in fact, by the next morning, we had managed to not only fire up my own lab and 3D printers, but also the digital fabrication lab and all of the 3D printers there. Uh, we very quickly put out an email to our faculty students and alumni, and these are some videos uh, of the 3D printers in action, uh, printing the visors uh, for the protective face shield. And in less than three days, we went from a few labs on Cornell's campus uh, to a network of over 250 offices, alumni architects, such as many of you on this panel, uh, students, faculty, and other research units uh, participating in our local regional uh, cluster of makers, architects, and designers. Uh, this is a quote uh, from one of our uh, dear alumni, Gary Handel, uh, who participated uh, in Operation PPE. Um, to date, uh, we have delivered over 25,000 protective face shields. I should mention a little bit about what, what they are. Uh, the 3D printed component is the visor that actually fits uh, over your forehead. And the protective face shield uh, is 
uh, a clear transparent sheet uh, that can either be laser cut uh, or uh, punched with a simple office three hole punch. Uh, so one can immediately um, get, to, get to work in terms of participating. Uh, and AAP, we were able to not only 3D print, but laser cut hundreds of the transparent sheets, uh, which were then delivered directly to Weill Cornell Medicine. So I think one of the things that has been, you know, so tremendously powerful and amazing in the context of this initiative is the network itself, uh, that through informal fabrication, we were able to leverage our, our skills, our technologies, and the kind of DIY culture that 3D printing and digital fabrication provides uh, to immediately respond. And I think many of us in the community uh, at Cornell and beyond uh, were wondering how we could contribute and help. And, and so it, it, you know, from day one, it became immediately clear that we, we could do something. And it's through this network of people working together that we were able to respond to gaps uh, in the supply chain, uh, the lack of protective uh, equipment for our frontline workers, and uh, to, at the same time, you know, work individually uh, as teams uh, in a safe uh, fashion uh, in terms of respecting social distancing, and and really to to leverage, um, you know, what was immediately at hand and to respond accordingly. I've been continuing to work with colleagues at Weill Cornell Medicine. Uh, this little video highlights um, the assembly of one of the shields. Uh, the visor itself was actually, we were fortunate, was pre-approved uh, by colleagues at Weill Cornell Medicine. And the design comes out of uh, a group in Sweden. Uh, they're, they're, they're a 3D printing manufacturer, uh, 3D Verkstan. And this visor has actually since been approved by the NIH. So again, we were able to immediately hit the ground running uh, with this approval uh, to begin to print and supply uh, the gaps that we were seeing in terms of supply in the front line. Uh, this uh, quote actually came through in a, an incredible email just the day before yesterday uh, from a recent Cornell graduate, uh, Shrag, uh, who graduated in 2018 uh, from the College of Human Ecology. He's now in his first year of medical school and has been volunteering as an EMT on the front lines. And here you can see him uh, wearing one of our protective face shields. And he just mentioned that everything that they've been using in terms of PPE, hand sanitizer, N95s, N95s and so on have been donated. And so everybody's contribution um, has you know, been incredible in terms of protecting these heroes on the front lines. Uh, we've been fortunate to receive a lot of really positive press on the initiative. Um, we not only inspired people regionally to get involved, um, but there are clusters of makers and architects and designers now operating out of USC in Los Angeles uh, with Alvin Huang. Uh, CMU also launched an initiative as well as universities in Chicago and beyond and also internationally. Uh, in fact, I heard from uh, the government of South Africa uh, early on in the initiative uh, wanting to know uh, how to print the visors and, and get started with their own effort. So again, I just want to come back to, you know, the power of the network and our ability to leverage informal fabrication in times of crisis, um, you know, to, to really deliver and, and to, to take advantage of our skills and expertise and to operate collaboratively uh, which I really think is, is the future and the answer as to how we can address these crises now, but also those that we face uh, down the road. Uh, in my own lab, uh, we have not only continued to contribute to the production of PPE, but we've also been working collaboratively with colleagues at Weill Cornell Medicine, um, with colleagues at the University of Washington and Princeton uh, to work on uh, products and uh, other elements uh, that are necessary on the front lines, such as this non-rebreather mask, uh, things that we could immediately uh, put out to our network and have them uh, easily fabricated. Uh, and this has also inspired a, an amazing collaboration that I'm sure Eric will touch upon uh, with his work on the patient isolation hood. 
And this is my last slide. Uh, just yesterday, I had a meeting with my team. This is Maddie Eggers, uh, who graduated last year with her BARC, and she recently was one of our teaching associates and has worked in my lab uh, for over five years. Uh, but we've been innovating designs and fabrication techniques. This is our fabric harness, which is a easily 3D printed 2D form that through a special algorithm called a living hinge uh, can conform and fit to the face, uh, allowing for someone to use any sort of off the shelf fabric uh, material uh, to protect themselves. Uh, so I'll, I'll end with that. Um, thanks so much for uh, attending this panel and I'm, I'm really looking forward to engaging your questions. I'll pass it over to Vivian. Hey, hi everyone. Um, let me just share my screen. One second. This should. Okay. Sorry. Uh, so thank you for the uh, introduction, Bob, and um, thank you so much, Jenny and uh, Dean Meijin, for really uh, this amazing and inspiring initiative. Um, and uh, so today I'm really uh, excited to share our small role in a much bigger story. And it's a story about, you know, the strength of our community, as well as compassion and heart. And, um, and you know, we definitely need more of that um, in this day and age. So um, I'm going to talk a little bit and share uh, uh, what Terraform One does. Um, and in particular, uh, the community that we're in, which I think is uh, central to our link and connection with the PPE operation and the story. So just to give you a little bit of background, um, Terraform One was founded by two architects who wanted to create a nonprofit um, outside of traditional architecture practice, which would use design, research, and fabrication as tools to create um, innovative solutions that would look at environmental problems that would face future cities. Uh, sorry, let me see why is this not. Okay. Um, so it was really conceived as this sort of uh, transdisciplinary uh, think and do tank that would be like an urban garage to experiment on different um, issues that could face cities and uh, really from an environmental scope or lens. Um, so some of the research topics that we look at are uh, waste, biodiversity, air quality, mobility, and food. Um, so this is an example of looking at nature systems, a recent uh, research project in how um, how the gut bacteria of mealworms can actually digest styrofoam, which is a major problem affecting cities and waste. Um, in looking at that, we applied it to a project uh, that was an urban renewal project um, to, uh, to relook at um, Camden, New Jersey. So, um, I'm kind of going to go through some of these more quickly. Um, this was a mock-up and a prototype of the worms digesting styrofoam. Um, and this will be um, installed in Camden, New Jersey um, later this spring. It's a urban renewal initiative. That's an example of public-private partnership and philanthropy uh, funded by uh, Bloomberg Philanthropy as a way to solve some of um, uh, urban issues uh, through the power of design and imagination and collaboration. Another uh, big research topic that we looked at uh, for the last few years now is about biodiversity and uh, the fact that wildlife population has decreased by over 50%. Um, and the fact that in the built environment, uh, biodiversity is oftentimes overlooked um, as a criteria, um, occupying only 5% of building 
um, certifications. So um, in using our um, design and imagination and our, uh, as well as also a theme of collaboration, um, we worked with uh, on a development project and created an idea of a, um, a vertical meadow, a uh, butterfly sanctuary um, for butterflies. And in coming up with innovative materials, we worked with corporations to develop a very ecological concrete uh, project, which would be sort of um, super ecological with embedded fly ash to use material science innovation and collaboration across corporations to, um, to come up with uh, new products and applications. Um, and then also to engage the public in these kind of innovations. Um, now, a big part, as I mentioned, of the PPE story is the fact that we're part of this larger community. So what we do between the research projects, the design, and the public engagement piece is really um, being in this Navy Yard. It's a 300 acre manufacturing space um, that was the prime manufacturing uh, place for all the US Naval ships up through World War II. It was decommissioned after the Korean War. And, um, and this community and ecosystem of fabricators, makers, uh, designers, and entrepreneurs is what really allowed us the day that Mijin and uh, Jenny reached out and, uh, and I learned about this Operation PPE, um, our role was really in, in uh, is uh, reaching out to all the various 3D printers, fabricators within this whole ecosystem. So here we are uh, that within the last few years, there's been a lot of development um, another element of the Navy Yard, which I think is a factor in mobilizing design, is a new paradigm for governance structures. So the Navy Yard is federal land, but it's really governed and operated by a nonprofit organization whose mission is to create jobs. So that's the metric in which um, this place operates. And it is not a for-profit you know, it's waterfront property, so it could easily um, be a, um, you know, be a prime site for some major condos, but it's not. And so I think that in this next um, now and in the future, um, new governance uh, structures that have the, the uh, people's benefit and social wel welfare at heart is an important part of the formula and how we can enhance our impact using uh, design. Um, so at the heart of the Navy Yard is this old machine shop, which has now become this uh, new lab space, which is uh, conceived as a maker space for entrepreneurs, designers, inventors, and creatives. Um, <clears throat> and part of it is that unlike a WeWork space, which is software, this uh, new lab actually um, provides advanced fabrication uh, facilities, which gives access to innovators and entrepreneurs to actually prototype, which unless you are actually associated with an institution, it would be very difficult to give access to uh, cultivate this kind of innovation. Um, so that's the Terraform space in purple. Um, and during the the uh, and you know during the COVID-19, New Lab uh, has been deemed an essential uh, business, and within New Lab there are over a hundred companies, uh, twenty of which actually provide or have pivoted to their technologies and products to help um, battle uh, you know the the crisis that we're in. So um, so New Lab was already in production in producing face shields. And um, I was really happy as an alumni and uh, seeing the sort of the collaboration going on at, um, at Cornell to be able to tap into this 
um, initiative and New Lab, thankfully, along with other um, companies within the Navy Yard like G-Create and Bednark, uh, donated um, the 3D printed parts to uh, su support the Wild Cornell uh, PPE uh, initiative. So, um, so as a final slide or image, I just wanted to show uh, hopefully an optimistic image of um, a potential future and of the power of design that we all have. I think design education is uh, an amazing foundation that could be applied in so many ways. And I think in the future, particularly for uh, healthy and um, healthy, vibrant and sustainable cities, that using our imagination to look at taking back the street for people to, um, to provide um, uh, uh, you know, the space and the density and um, you know, that's optimal for healthy living will be uh, key. So thank you. That's it. Thank you, Vivian. <laughs> we'll turn it over to Eric. Okay. Um, thanks, everybody, for um, for the invitation to come and, and discuss with you all. Um, I'll try to be quick. As you know, um, the story of Operation PPE, a call went out. Uh, we responded fairly quickly. Uh, it's not until I sort of printed one and made one, I put it on my face, and I realized it was actually um, fairly straightforward. I mean, the design is so brilliant in its ability to be made so quickly and easily without any special skills. And I think that was interesting to learn that um, medical equipment we think of as super specialized, but this design was so uh, straightforward that it actually um, made it easy uh, to disseminate. Uh, and that's something to sort of keep in mind as designers. Um, after we sort of printed, we sort of got involved with other initiatives. This is the Patient Isolation Hood Initiative. This was a Slack channel that was organized by um, Mass General Brigham's Health COVID Innovation center looking at patient isolation um, and this brought together you know hundreds of designers from around the world to sort of develop something that was bigger than a face mask smaller than a room you know somewhere at the scale of the body sort of the upper body and so uh, with a group of distributed designers we started working on solutions to create lightweight semi-enclosures that were um, deployed over patients as they were undergoing uh, some risky procedures um, that Slack channel sort of yielded a number of designs that were sort of co-produced, co-authored. Uh, and one of them, this one that Apollo 1 was actually deployed in MGH's um, uh, ER or an OR spaces. So different care environments where patients are coming in, they might be coughing, they might actually, we don't know, they might be um, uh, positive. Uh, and so it's super risky for doctors and healthcare providers to sort of work on patients that are actually, you know, coughing and breathing lots of contagious sort of material. So with this group of designers, a lot of them from Harvard GSD, where I teach, um, we sort of converged on a set of issues, developed some prototypes, had them tested uh, and, and deployed. And for me, that was kind of eye-opening to actually work with people that I'd never met before people that were sort of informally assembled through this network, uh, converge on solutions. It was very non-hierarchical. People sort of commented on Slack, said that's a good idea. The clinicians commenting on Slack saying, I need to get my arm in through there. Can you add this thing? Uh, and we prototyped the design in, in probably less than two weeks, which is kind of um, staggering. Um, this work has been ongoing. We've been developing different kinds of hoods for different scenarios, different care environments, some for surgery, some for ER. Uh, and working with fabricators to develop different uh, types of hoods. This is Apollo 6, um, which is a kind of rigid hood. The previous one was a disposable hood. Uh, this Apollo 6 I delivered to MGH um, a couple weeks ago. This is Dr. Sam Smith, uh, who was sort of working uh, with the group, giving feedback and sort of helping advise what would be useful, what would be reasonable, what would be necessary. Uh, and so um, sharing this small story about a kind of design effort that was sort of kicked off by Jenny and the operation PPE has led to other avenues of design for us as a studio, for people in our studio as, as designers, how can we sort of make a difference? Um, it did open up my eyes to the idea that as designers, we have skills, we have uh, talents, we have access to 
fact, uh, fabrication and manufacturing uh, that are useful uh, to plug a kind of a blind spot, whether it's a blind spot in the supply chain or a kind of blind spot in the kind of design uh, world. I wanted to make another comment, which is, you know, Herbert Simon wrote that uh, the science is, is uh, the study of the world as it is, and design is the study of the world as it ought to be. And I think that's a pretty inspiring quote, because it, this question of ought to be sort of pushes designers to not just sort of accept the world as it is, but to sort of push design uh, into areas where it could become better, you know, and so this idea of sort of improving the world through design, I think is something that we share as designers. Um, and then the last couple of slides, um, as some of you know, um, you know, the events in the world are incredibly um, overwhelming, you know, the sort of uh, the violence that's sort of uh, uh, put on display uh, in such a vivid way has sort of catalyzed people to say, um, what's going on? This is unacceptable. How do we act as, as uh, citizens, as individuals, as designers, as institutions? Um, and how do we sort of address questions of social justice and, and Black Lives Matter? Um, and I wanted to share this image, which I just saw a couple of days ago. Um, we have been working on the University of Virginia's Memorial to Enslaved Laborers. This is a memorial to acknowledge the slaves that worked on the University of Virginia grounds during its construction and during its early years of operation up until the Civil War. Uh, and so um, just yesterday, uh, a group of faculty at UVA used the memorial as a sort of setting uh, to sort of affirm that the medical students would vow that questions of race and racism would not affect the way they treat their um, patients. Um, and for us, this is an incredibly uh, powerful uh, use of a space that was conceived of as a space of gathering, a space of convening. Uh, and it sort of, I just saw this picture, it just sort of worked that way, that people gathered there to sort of address questions of race and to begin discussions of repair. So it just seemed too, um, too poignant and too relevant uh, to not share. Um, and the question is, how do questions of PPE and design affect questions of, of social justice and other sort of broad societal questions. And I don't want to hijack the conversation. I know there's lots of questions to discuss. So I'll stop sharing now, but uh, hopefully we can um, pick up a conversation in, in different ways, um, think about design broadly. Great. Eric, <clears throat> thank you. Um, let's shift over to a, a couple of questions. We're already getting some, some comments in from our our uh, virtual participants. So please continue to submit those. Um, wanted to just shift a little bit in the direction and, and not to ignore what you're talking about, Eric, but you know, the issue of these new networks of collaborators, I think is really one of the important aspects that um, in many cases, traditional architectural design has a known group of participants and, and actors. And in this one, it seemed like given the urgency of the medical world and the deficiency in supply chains, it seems like a whole series of new collaborations have opened up that were largely in various silos within the medical production and medical equipment industries. And now there's this new layering. And I'd love to hear from each of you about kind of how, how these new networks have started to formulate maybe new relationships, new products. Uh, Jenny, I know you showcased that new uh, face uh, textured face mask, which also leads into some important ideas of design innovation that might also lead us to think about um, greater health protection for all of the rest of us that are trying to move back into a more regular and more of our standard routines. But uh, may be reluctant to using certain kinds of face shields. So let's explore a little bit about the networks and maybe where it's leading into new products or new innovation. So let me turn it over to you, Jenny. Sure. Um, well, first of all, I, I don't think I've ever collaborated with so many people who I, I haven't met in person. Um, you know, we, we, we've communicated through Slack and, and other mediums. Um, and, you know, in the context of my core research and what we do in my lab at AAP, I've been collaborating with, with people across disciplinary boundaries and material science and engineering and biology for, for many years now to innovate uh, new materials and fabrication protocols. But I think what was so, and what continues to be so unique about this transdisciplinary collaboration 
is how effective we have been able to be in, an, in a kind of immediate way. Um, so, you know, issues of, of authorship and IP just have gone out the window in, in a wonderful way. <laughs> um, you know, where, of course, health and safety are at the forefront, um, but the, the kind of stop gaps that typically get in the way of collaborating across disciplines uh, have been lifted and have been lifted because of the urgency of the crisis. And, and that I think has been really inspiring uh, to see. And I, I hope it, it opens up new types of models uh, for how you know, collaboration is, is not only done, how it's structured, but also how we can get uh, these products and materials out into the world in a, in a more immediate fashion. Um, so the fluidity of the exchange, you know, from co with colleagues in engineering, with students who were, you know, disbanded in their homes working with their own printers, which was, you know, just has been incredible, um, you know, to daily uh, Zoom calls with colleagues at Weill Cornell Medicine has contributed collectively uh, to not only moving along the production of the PPE, but also to very quickly innovate and respond to these new products. So the, the fabric face harness, for example, is a collaborative effort, you know, not only in my lab, but with, with others giving immediate feedback um, from their area of expertise. And I, as I mentioned in my short presentation, I really do think that the power of the network and, and working across these disciplinary boundaries um, is, is absolutely the, the future. And as architects and designers, we have an ability to, to synthesize, to, to think across a set of complex relationships, to form a plan and to move into action. And so even though we're not working on, on a building or a kind of application that we're used to, those skill sets um, are really, really needed and necessary. And so the role of design um, now and in the future in this context, I think is, is paramount. And so I'm, I'm really excited for, you know, our students, but also our alumni and, and to see, you know, what's going to happen next in, in these really difficult, complex, unprecedented and extraordinary times. Vivian, do you want to share anything on, on your network and its expansion? <laughs> um, yeah, no, just a few thoughts, uh, some points that I touched upon about sort of um, <clears throat> a new way of governance um, that as well from many different levels, from the city level, uh, back when I worked um, in architectural practice and my, um, my experience in working with city agencies, uh, my experience now has really changed a lot. And I think that cities have also adapted and have changed in the way that do, they do things in the way that they're much more open to collaboration. Um, within New York itself, um, there are moonshot competitions. There, they actually, the mayor's office of technology has office hours within the new lab space. Um, they're looking to deploy and scale up uh, new technologies in ways that could benefit the city that could you know, we worked with the mayor's office of sustainability where um, the, the, um, the deployment of a combination of design technology and implementation has never been more um, quickly adapted than what I've seen um, in the last few years. So, um, so I think that that collaboration, you know, to, I completely agree with the points that Jenny made that collaboration is key. And I think that the network deployment that some of these changes within agencies have made it much easier to demobilize and to get, you know, solutions implemented. Yeah, yeah. Eric, your thoughts? Maybe I could add one thing. I mean, architecture is such a kind of team effort. You know, no architecture is built by an individual. It's always about uh, collaboration. Um, the memorial I showed was, you know, with Mabel Wilson, with Etzel at the Tigbe, like we worked with landscape architects, historians, you know, community um, organizers. So, you know, to build anything requires such an extensive network of, of individuals. So, you know, I like Jenny's point about authorship and, and you know, questions of, of attribution. 
very quickly those traditional hierarchies sort of disappeared. And I think that's one of the most exciting moments, which is, you know, this um, horizontal sort of connections with different people with different skills. Um, the PIH project I showed was with designers I'd never met before, people that didn't come from strict architectural backgrounds, you know, industrial designers that had ideas about, about how do you attach something to something else, the fabric, you know, not something that architects sometimes think about. We think about details, but we think about them differently. So recognizing interdisciplinarity, but also acknowledging expertise, you know, and so it's great to collaborate, collaborate with others, but knowing that they know things that I don't know and bringing those to the table, that's super exciting. Um, and just one last thought about, you know, architectural education, you know, because we're talking about Cornell and studio environments and, you know, we encourage people to, to be creative and to be thoughtful and to be innovative. But one thing I would suggest is like, when we think about our pedagogy, you know, where's the team work in pedagogy? You know, so much of the way I was educated was individuals working on their own projects. And I think we're shifting towards teams of students working together, which is more true to the, what they're gonna find in the world outside and probably more strategic uh, to make changes in the world to think about working uh, collaboratively in school as well as outside of school. No, great points. Um, just wanted to uh, remind the audience uh, that we, we have some time for some questions. So please uh, use either the chat or the Q&A box to submit questions. Um, I, just thinking going forward as the university is uh, preparing to actually reopen, which of course we're, we're not sure when that's exactly going to happen. We're hoping to hear more in the next couple of weeks. But it seems like these lessons and these collaborations may actually redefine how we start to plan for the reopening of the Cornell campus, both in New York City, where I am, but also more profoundly and, and potentially more importantly, how the main campus in Ithaca reopens and what this experience might lead to in terms of new PPE or new devices that might actually help our students remain safe, but also maybe even new collaborations across the campus. And I think even broadly, given that we have a reunion underway, how do we actually look at expanding this network and how can we actually reach into our alumni network in a way that we can even broaden that collaboration? So a couple of thoughts on, on, on collaboration in the university within the different colleges. I know, Jenny, you've been collaborating with engineering and, and um, other folks across the campus. I was curious if you're seeing a change in those new relationships uh, and that might actually lead to a kind of a, a new model of working together as we resume or return back to a, a more normal existence in Ithaca. Yeah, no, de I, definitely. I think the, the relationships that have come forth out of the, the Operation PPE initiative not only are continuing, but I, I think they will, you know, continue to thrive in the future. I, for example, I've already worked on a couple of different proposals with colleagues in engineering and at Weill Cornell Medicine uh, to push forward designs that we're working on for healthcare professionals uh, and products um, used with patients. But also very recently, we're having conversations around engaging uh, design students in AAP and beyond uh, to help innovate around how we reopen the campus and how we design um, you know, space dividers and, and, and think about space in a, in a different way, you know, so social distancing in that six foot metric becomes a kind of interesting constraint. And, you know, how do we, how do we think about that um, more locally to also solve, you know, the, the issues that we have in terms of ensuring that our campus uh, and also campuses in New York City are, are safe and that we can uh, follow strict gui guidelines uh, to ensure the health and safety of, of all so I think it's a real opportunity and actually just recently with, with me, Jin and other faculty and colleagues, we were discussing some exciting um, potentials for how that might take place. And, and again, to come back to your point, Bob, I think it would be a tremendous um, opportunity to then re-engage our alumni network uh, in that context um, in terms of getting feedback and, and even you know, having people participate directly. Yeah, yeah. And is that really through like a Slack channel or other platforms that might allow the alumni to be more engaged? I, I'm so curious about how we might memorialize what's been done and how we might codify it for future challenges or, you know, ongoing innovation. 
Yeah, I mean, that part of the conversation is still really fresh and fluid. Um, but I, I, I'm sure, you know, in the immediate future, we'll, we'll launch, uh, relaunch a Slack channel. We had a, an incredible Slack channel that's still live uh, for Operation PPE. It, it became so big that it was actually, um, you know, just overwhelming. Uh, but I, one point that I think was really important early on with the initiative is that um, we implemented the Slack channel and then we also put all of the files and information on my lab site. Uh, which you can still visit and people are you know continuing to contribute so i how we continue to keep the network alive and um active is is very much uh, a part of conversations right now so yeah. to be continued yeah absolutely well why don't we think a little bit about um uh, scaling up because we clearly are now moving towards a direction where the need for social distancing and the new metrics of our ability to reestablish more of an open society um, are going to really depend on our ability to solve really critical design problems spatially. And I was just curious, Eric, I know you've talked in the past about the whole issue of visualizing the future and being able to actually design and create the future that we really want. And, you know, prior to our conversation today, we had a chance to talk a little bit about the public realm and how we see that changing or the need for its transformation. would love to hear your thoughts on how we're going to move forward and how we might actually start to redefine and scale up from the immediate PPE to actually thinking about a societal shift that might allow us to actually coexist and, and start to resume a more engaged life. Um, I, I do think um, obviously the pandemic has rethinking so many things. Um, and as we sort of think about re-entry or um, turning to campus, returning to uh, a previous idea of what normal meant, uh, I think it's a great opportunity to also reimagine. You know, so not just re-entry, but reimagine how we reimagine being apart and how we reimagine being together. Um, the social distancing is really not social distancing; it's spatial distancing. You know, social. We're going to be social in different ways, and we have to build those communities. Sometimes we have to rebuild them better than they were, but I think it's a design problem. You know, how do we imagine a question of neighborhood? How do we imagine a sense of community? How do we imagine a better community, a more just community? So I think, you know, over the last semester, we've all been reactive. We've been sort of virtual by emergency or by necessity. I think as we conceptualize all semester and forward, I think we're gonna be virtual by design. And that means that we'll be more deliberate about it. how do we conceptualize pedagogy for kind of mixed, co-present, remote uh, learning environments. So I think that's super exciting. But I do think it puts more pressure on us uh, to articulate what are our values, why do we insist on in coming together, and how we put together deliberately uh, to produce the kind of neighborhood and community that we want. You know, so that's a kind of design challenge in a kind of super abstract way. But hopefully it requires a bit more deliberateness and less kind of matter of habit or matter of, you know, we always did it that way. Great, thank you. Um, we're gonna take some more questions from the group and um, we have uh, one that's in from Alan Cantor. Um, and Alan asks, how about periodic and continuing forums, including alumni participation and how we might advance that? Any thoughts? He's, he's suggesting again, periodic and continuing forums, how we might institutionalize this. And I know that we, are hoping to do a series of additional forums well beyond just the topic of racism, but also other topics that we think are really vital to the issues of sustainability and resilience. Any thoughts on, on how we might be able to solidify that? I have a thought. I mean, um, you know, Ithaca is, is gorgeous, as we all know. Um, it's hard to get to. It's sometimes hard for alumni to come back to campus, right? Even if you want to, it's really a kind of deliberate act to sort of go there and to come back and to, to meet in person. I found since the pandemic, I've been so much more connected to, um, to colleagues and friends from around the world because now that we're on Zoom, um, it doesn't require the kind of the trip, you know? And so it's produced a kind of new intimacy, you know, whereas before, uh, we have to really sort of make an effort to get to Ithaca to sort of reconvene. Um, there's a new kind of connectivity, and that's that network that we started talking about. Um, the idea of this kind of immediacy or intimacy that's enabled through um, remote working could also produce 
kinds of communities in different forms. So I'm optimistic that we can reimagine what an alumni network is uh, in a distributed format through the kind of new intimacy of, of, of these mediums. Yeah. Yeah, yeah and I'll, I'll just add to that. Um, there's a, a really exciting uh, and ongoing conversation around the role of design at Cornell uh, with you know, some, some interesting task forces starting to uh, come together, bringing colleagues together from uh, the College of Human Ecology, Engineering, Cornell Tech, uh, Computer Science, and of course, uh, AAP. Um, and, and so I think that conversation is, is definitely going to inspire uh, more structured uh, connections with alumni in, in various format and formats in terms of looking at design and its, its various facets across disciplines, but also outside of Corn Cornell and beyond uh, with our alumni. Yeah, I think um, there's also opportunities to create uh, cross college teams to focused around particular challenges, whether it's about um, <clears throat> rethinking, you know, um, space making when it comes to social um, equity, uh, about, you know, air quality. Um, uh, I guess I've always been in this sort of environmental um, framework, but, um, but just, you know, the university is such a, uh, has such rich resources across all the alumni and colleges. So I think there's some real opportunity with this uh, shift in rethinking the way that we work together and collaborate, whether it's um, through the curriculum where there's more um, uh, cross-registered um, students, uh, you know, uh, and faculty collaborating across colleges or um, with alumni in different industries as well. I think there's, there's many different ways to try to um, uh, find ways to work together. So I think um, uh, the Cornell Tech Campus as well is a great place that is in a way a vision of the future of where Cornell is going and bringing together all the different colleges um, in this one campus. So. Uh, we have time for just a few more questions. Um, I'm going to bring one forward that's dealing a little bit more with the PPE question. And this is from Joan Johnson, uh, Human Ecology Class of 65. How do you de determine next steps in design as the science modifies what is the ideal face covering? Now I understand it should be a three-layered face covering with different types of materials. Thank you. Maybe I'll uh, address that briefly. Uh, so I think the, the answer is, is really in, in the context of the collaboration and, and um, working in a nimble fashion and fluid fashion with, with our colleagues uh, who are in the medical profession with medical expertise, uh, but also in engineering. Uh, but that isn't to say that you know, their expertise can also influence a different way of, of looking at the problem. Um, and that's where I think we as designers and architects uh, can can bring you know some some interesting uh, points of view uh, to innovate and to innovate together. Uh, so it's it's an ongoing discussion. Uh, as all of you know, there's so much about this virus that we don't know about still, and it it, it is changing every day. Um, and so that also requires that we're nimble with with how we're collaborating and how we're uh, making design changes and and so on. Uh, another question came in that was focused on the idea of um, how we might actually involve, uh, or excuse me, how we might actually look to local strategic stockpiles of PPE and the types of needs that we have going forward on the main campus. And it's certainly as we imagine a large concentration of students returning, the immediate needs of the medical community may in fact start to lead to a more localized need. Was just curious uh, whether or not that's something that's now being contemplated. Okay, so I'll jump in again. Yeah, um, sorry about that, Jenny. <laughs> uh, no, it's fine. So yes, the answer is yes. Uh, there, there are actually, I mean, a number of people already involved from the Operation PPE initiative, uh, even also 
outside of Cornell's, um, there's a no local nonprofit, Ithaca Generator, uh, which has contributed to a lot of the production. Um, but there has been quite a bit of conversation around how we will adequately supply our, both our faculty and our students with, with PPE uh, and how, how that can also come, continue to come out of our own labs and our own resources um, and ability to, to produce um, the, those products uh, more locally. Great, great. Well, we are now at four o'clock, so we're going to bring it to a close. Uh, for those that have written in about recording and access to this, we will make sure that that's available and posted so that you can actually get the audio and the full video. I want to thank our panelists, Jenny, Vivian, and Eric for their time and their input and for sharing their stories. Uh, we're particularly grateful to all of the work that you put forward, especially at this critical time. We look forward to participating and having this dialogue go for further and hope that the participants will return again in the coming weeks. Thank you all. Goodbye. <laughs>